Okay. We are live. Hello, Sandra. Hello, Panayotis. We already have our people. Uh, come again. Welcome, Kate. Very nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Let's, let's, let's give them a couple of minutes for people to, to show up. Uh, everyone, please leave a comment. Uh, we'd love to see uh, how many people join us today. From YouTube, from uh, Facebook, I think this goes live. Of hi Alexander Delianis, hi Eleni, Hamu. Sorry if I'm butchering your names. I always do this, unfortunately, Kate. It's uh, we all do. Uh, That's why I shortened mine so that they don't butcher anymore. <laughs> it's a trick. It's a uh, trick. <laughs> Uh, Panayoti, uh, being an NGO founder, of course, allows you to buy a mansion. So, yeah, it's not a green screen behind me. It's it's my mansion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have our students, uh, or former students in this case. Good. With a lot of sense of humor. That's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's cool. It's so nice to to see people, you know, hanging around, joining our events, uh, participating in the community. Absolutely. I see. Oh my God, I'm going to butcher this. So, Girmachu or Jairmachu Teferi, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Please, everyone, leave a comment. Say where you're from. Let's give Kate uh, an understanding of a bit of the people we have online today. Uh, Kate, maybe just another minute and then we'll we'll go ahead. Okay. Hi, Mohamed Tavali. I, I know that. Mohammed, it's I've, I've learned it in the years. Hi from Greece, everyone. He mentions he's joining from Facebook Live. Welcome, Mohammed. Nice to see you today. Well, not see you. Read your comment. We can imagine. We can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh. All righty. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah, let's, let's go for it. More people will come in, Ma many, many more will watch it uh, when we record it and upload it. Also, our uh, events now uh, are also in podcast form, so you can find them on Spotify and any other place you listen to your podcasts. So that's awesome. Uh, Mohammed says, uh, hi, Damien and Kate. <laughs> you know my yeah. face, Damien. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Irina, watching from Athens. Good to see you. So we'll gather the questions. What I would like to do uh, in this session is me and Kate, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to share things. And at the end of the discussion, we'll leave like 15 minutes, probably maybe a bit more uh, in order to answer for Kate to answer your questions. So please, at any point, leave your, drop your question or comment, maybe with a bit of context. And um, yeah, we'll do it. So, Kate, officially welcome to Social Hacks Academy <laughs> community. So very pleased uh, to have you with us today. Uh, I, I, I checked your LinkedIn uh, profile, which I advise everyone to do after after the event, by the way. And you you have such a long and very interesting career. So. Let's go a bit from where, let's start way, way back at school, in university. Who, how was Kate at the moment? Wow, <laughs> I really need to tap into my archive memory to go there. Um, well, I think 
you know, sometimes when I think about my life, I think I was very blessed overall. I traveled all around the world. And even when I was at school, I actually already lived abroad. So I'm originally from, from Belarus, but I played tennis. I played junior tennis for 10 years. And so it took me a little bit around the world. So I lived one year in Spain. I lived a couple of years in, um, in Belgium. Then I also went to the US and then I graduated um, high school in Belarus. And this is where sort of the big decision came into place. What do I do? Do I play tennis or do I do go and study, right? Because it's, it's a little bit difficult to do both, to be honest. So I went to study and I went to study in, um, in Belgium. I studied international trade and international management. I graduated. I had my first job in Belgium. It was at Levi's. Until today, I still think it's one of the most amazing companies in the world. I really enjoyed working there. Amazing team, amazing product. Um, and then I sort of went around the world. I went to Italy. I joined uh, the luxury retail. So I started in Florence. Then I moved to China. I worked there in luxury retail as well. Then I always wanted to sort of learn. And I was in client experience management, client relationship management. And at that time in luxury, we were saying that the best people um, in CRM, in CX, are in hospitality because they've started way earlier than luxury retail. So what I want, decided to do, I decided to move to luxury hospitality. So I found a job in Bangkok. Okay. And uh, yeah, and it was, you know, an exciting place to be. And it was an amazing experience. I traveled sort of in Thailand and my company at the time had also hotels in the Maldives. So I also worked in the Maldives, which is an amazing experience. Um, and after that, I moved to Switzerland. Again, I went back to uh, luxury retail, a bit different from fashion. I was in well, luxury watches. I spent five years in my last company, um, again, still doing the same job, CRM and CX. And finally, last year, I decided to leave overall corporate and I went and I um, sort of got a project of my first productivity consulting project in a company that was a CRM agency, digital agency. So the objective was to help them to create a little bit more excellence in terms of the performance and the productivity in the ways that they were doing things. And when I finished the project, I moved out of Singapore. So that was in Singapore and I moved to Cyprus where I am now. So last year, end of the year, <laughs> I opened my own company. I became very active on LinkedIn, sort of sharing my thoughts. And um, last, I mean, not last, sorry, yesterday, I posted my 100th playbook um, on LinkedIn which is an amazing milestone for me because it's a lot of work. And I never thought that I would be sort of here and talking about this, but this is what happened in the last eight months. And um, yeah, so today I have my own company and I own the uh, thegoodbusy.com. So I consult people on productivity. I offer uh, workshops to teams and groups as well. And I do executive coaching. So I do individual coaching as well. And my main topic is always productivity for um, busy team leaders. I love working with um, team leaders. I love people who manage people. And I sort of believe that everything great in companies happens in teams. This is not my, these are not my words. These are, this is a quote from Adam Grant. And I, and I truly believe that. I believe that there is nothing Thing in life that we do alone although you know some might say I'm working alone I'm a solopreneur but around me there is a huge um, circle of support that is there for me constantly and who help me and motivate me to do things that I do on a daily basis so we're never alone yes yes we are we are never alone do you do you plan to scale this business what's what's your plan for for your current business Yes, absolutely. So I want to have a company. So I don't want to work alone. <laughs> okay. It's very hard. And I think it's important also to admit that we don't know everything. So it's important to surround ourselves with people who actually know things that we don't know and they're expert in their particular field. I might be expert in something, but outside of this periphery, I'm not very good at many things. So I want to bring these people in. It doesn't mean necessarily that I'm going to hire them. I don't know yet, but the plan is I would like to have a company of between five to 10 people. And I see it as a, as a cake, you know, when you kind of cook and you um, bake a cake, every ingredient plays a crucial part. 
And for me, that's what a good company is about, is that every single person plays a part, is a perfect, you know, and a secret ingredient for the company's success. So this is how I sort of see my business developing in the future. Very, very interesting perspective. The thing about okay, what happens though sometimes when you put more baking soda than you should, and then <laughs> the cake, you know. <laughs> exactly. So you need to make sure that they work well together. Every single ingredient, yes, that they exactly. complement each exactly. other. I agree. Yes. I, I have a question. You mentioned uh, that uh, up until your company, you were doing CRM and CX. Uh, I, could you please tell us what these terms uh, mean, just for a bit of context? Sure. So CRM is client relationship management and CX is client experience. And so a lot of actually companies um, have these functions. They can call them in different ways. But if I talk about CRM in a very simplistic terms, CRM people help sort of to collect client data help analyze this data and implement different campaigns. So for example, email marketing campaigns, or for example, ads uh, on social media or create any particular events. So I was the person sort of doing all of that. And that's also why I worked with a lot of people, for example, who were in IT developers as well, because you there is a lot of things, there's a lot of systems and automations behind all of this work that CRM managers or CX managers do. Okay. Is customer experience has to do with the online? Because I, I, is it similar to user experience or is it also in the retail stores, the customer experience in, in, the, in the physical realm? Yeah. So for me, mostly it was in physical world because I was in retail. So a lot of it uh, was in the physical world. And also in hospitality, it was more about how do we take care of the guests and how do we make them feel in our um, premises in our hotels. So, yeah. Okay. Lovely, lovely. So uh, it seems to me that being now a productivity coach, it's, it's, it's different, at least in my mind, from your past roles in retail and such. What, what drew you in this, maybe call it niche uh, thing, like wh what drew you into that? Um, there are a few things. So I was training, I was providing trainings to the teams um, in the companies where I worked for most of my life, most of my corporate career. So I loved training, I loved interacting with people. And in the last years of my career, one of my managers was extremely passionate about coaching and she introduced me to coaching. I didn't know necessarily what coaching was at the time because for me, coaching was more um, coaching in sports because I have a sports background. So this is what I thought. But what I realized is that I was actually using coaching already in the past in my trainings and my workshops because I was asking a lot of questions and coaching is nothing else. Well, it's much more sorry, coaches, if they hear me, <laughs> it's a lot of work and it's, a, it's you know, you need to have a lot of competences. But uh, first of all, it's asking questions. Coaching is asking questions and sort of helping the person to believe in their own potential and to believe that they actually have the information and they know exactly what they need to do to um, get where they want to be. So I um, developed a lot of workshops in my previous company and they had a lot of positive feedback. So that resonated with me because I drew energy from developing those workshops. So I decided, and it was a while that I was thinking, what do I want to do next? I didn't want necessarily to stay in the corporate world. So I decided to sort of investigate a little bit more coaching. I got a coaching degree. Um, so I became an executive coach. And I really love that. I really love sort of helping people to get from where they are to where they want to be. Um, and why productivity is a niche? Because I was an organization freak all my life. So I am a planner. I have uh, my father is a planner. So he made me so like believe that if you plan, you see important things, but the urgency sort of go away. So I really fell in love with planning when I was little. And because I had so many activities when I was little, I even had at that time, it was many, many years ago. So at that time, apps didn't exist. Calendars didn't exist. So what he did, he printed on an A4 paper my schedule and hang it, he framed it and he hang it, wow. you know, above my bed. So, you know, <laughs> from a very, very young age, planning wow. was in my life. So, and I believe it works. A lot of people think that planning is boring and routine is boring, but I think that it actually allows you 
to gain a lot of flexibility and a lot of agility. And it allows you to create space for actually what's important for you. So I, I do believe in planning. <laughs> That's awesome. That, that's I, I would love. I would love to have that as a child. I don't know. I was quite, uh, you know, quite active as a child. I don't know. But now that I'm not as active as I used to be, I think I would love this. This the, to have a very specific plan, because what what it does to me when I have my calendar. If you see it, it's like packed, jam packed with. I schedule. I book time for myself to do specific tasks. Everything is there. Uh, so it, it's really, uh, to me, it clears my mind. Since I know what I have to do, it clears my mind and opens my creativity. It, it enhances, maybe to call it better, my creativity to do more at the specific task at hand. 100%. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So let me let me go to, to a question. How can web developers identify and prioritize tasks to maximize their pro their productivity during the workday. I, I ask this question because most of our uh, people here are uh, web developers or interested to be in tech or are just joining the tech industry. So how can they identify and prioritize tasks to maximize their productivity? The number one rule for productivity is to start with the end in mind no matter what we do whether it's we're working on something big or we're working on something small we always need to start with the end in mind if we don't have a goal or in other words if we don't have the destination we will never get there right as zig ziglar said if you aim at nothing you always get nothing and the reason i think that a lot of people get into this hamster wheel and do more and more and more it's because we don't know where we're going. We don't have the destination. So we just do tasks and they create a bit of chaos and they are spread everywhere. When we have an exact destination, we can direct our business towards that destination. And so it becomes clear, it becomes easier for you to prioritize, to decide what to do next, to decide what not to do, to decide what, what's to postpone. Your goal is sort of your North Star for your decision for decision making. But if you don't have the goal, it's very sort of hard to decide what task to postpone, what task to do first, what task to focus on, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay. M many, many developers face distractions. You know, we have our social media, so many notifications uh, that goes on in your watch, in your phone, tablet, whatever you use and many other online platforms. How can they manage these distractions to maintain focus and be more productive? I'm not going to say anything new here. <laughs> Remove distractions. <laughs> so there are a number of ways to, to, to do that. So I think that the first thing to understand is there is this concept that's called paradox of choice. Um, and a lot, of thing, a lot of people think that more is more, but in reality, more is less. So whenever you see a lot of information, you send a lot of signals to your brain. Um, more than 80% of our actions happen because of the visual cues that are sent to our brain. So the more we see, the more sort of action and the more chaos is going to happen in our brain. So what we need to do, we need to minimize all of that. So how to do that? Number one, do we really need an application? Do we for every single thing. So Marie Kondo your phone, Marie Kondo your computer. That's as simple as that. If you haven't used you know, the application in the last months, remove it. If you are using it once a month, can you just go to the web browser to check the thing that you need to check? So just removing and sort of being mindful of what we download and put into our computer and a phone, it's already going to help removing those distractions. The second one, notifications. There is one rule that I have been sort of following for seven years already is that the most important news will always find you. So remove all the notifications. I don't have any notifications on my phone except WhatsApp. Why? Because this is where my family and my friends are. All the rest can wait. I don't have email notifications. I don't have LinkedIn notifications. I don't have Instagram notifications. Because when we are 
um, sort of giving in to notifications, we're giving control of our time, right, to someone else. But when we are in charge, so I decide when I want to go and check the social media or I want to do, you know, I want to have a chat with a, with a friend, that kind of gives me back that control of, of my time and that allows me to remove those distractions um, away. So these are not new, but it's just a matter of doing that. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of, you know, do you, uh, whatever that means, do you. For example, yeah. I have built, I, I have very similar uh, uh, process like yours, uh, only WhatsApp. Uh, uh, I have notifications. Okay, I have Slack for work, so so that's an important notification I, I need to be addressing. But pretty much everything else is turned on, and I also have developed a system with my smartphone, my smartwatch. So before meetings, for example, because sometimes I forget, uh, I get a specific notification one minute before the meeting, and that's that, that's the only notification I'm getting from my watch during yeah. specific times yeah. it's it's really investing time because you know yeah. there are all these apps we have on our phones on our computers and whatnot emails 10 10 chat message uh, apps uh, whatsapp telegram whatnot invest 10 hours or whatever it takes in order to create a good system that works Absolutely. for you because it's 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 really not worth spending all this time it's at the end nothing happens nothing good comes out of it absolutely and you mentioned the word um system i think that's another thing to consider so many of us sort of have all these notifications because we are we have this fomo right we're like expecting something very very important but this is another thing that you can do um, whether it's at work or even with your circle of friends and family if it's urgent it's a call if it's not urgent it's a text and then in this sense you don't necessarily kind of need the notifications to be always on especially like on social media right um, and as i said earlier the big news will will sort of always find you anyway so no matter no matter what you do yeah, and you know, the world, everybody wants to watch the news and be constantly plugged in. It's really like, is it that important? If there is a fire next to you, you'll probably see it or smell it, or someone will come and save you, right? I agree. It's, yeah, the world will probably not end yeah. during your time of focus. Yeah, I <laughs> probably. I stopped watching news um, seven years ago. And I used to watch news at breakfast every single every mm. single day. What I did, I replaced the news with a TED talk. So you can just do um, you know, calculations of how many TED talks have I seen until now. So I'm a massive TED talk nerd, but there is so much that you can do. And I'm not saying that every minute needs to be optimized and you need, need to study. I, I truly believe that we all need to have rest, and I believe that we need to have mindful procrastination time. Because, you know, forbidden fruit always tastes sweeter. So it's always best to just enjoy a little bit of procrastination time. But I think that if we just look at the way we use time today, we would be surprised how much time we do have at our disposal. But the way we use it is probably not, not what we want it to be. You need to be specific. You need to set a goal. You need to know yes. what you want to achieve. Yes. And then... It's, it becomes so much easier for you to, to actually get there. Yeah, you, you mentioned the term that I've never heard. I don't know. Is it yours or mindful procrastination? I, I, yeah. I love this. Would you like to elaborate maybe on that? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's my term. I probably heard it somewhere. I, I always believe that we somewhere we hurt things, right? So it is what it is. Yeah. Um, I just... I think a lot of people think that like we have a lot of people talking about procrastination and procrastination is all bad. I agree that if we're procrastinating 80% of the time is sort of, it can be bad because it's nothing good comes out of it. But I'm a believer of 80, 80, 20 rule in everything. So I apply it to everything. So if 80% of the time I am productive and I am delivering and I'm working towards my goals and I insist that having goals is very, very important because otherwise the busyness becomes a chaos. 
So then it's fine. Then 20%, I can do whatever with it. I can be as flexible as I want because first of all, I will not feel guilty. Secondly, I remind to myself that I'm a human, right? So even an, any car doesn't run uh, without a fuel, right? Just on an empty tank. So it's very important for us to get that in. And I think it's also about dopamine and just like just enjoying life once in a while, you know, and Netflix, whatever you want to do, <laughs> whatever, you know, feels good for you in terms of procrastination or even being on Instagram and watching dog videos, which I do, you know, but I, I know that I don't do that eight hours a day. I only do it 10 minutes a day, but it's absolutely fine because earlier you mentioned something very, very important. We have so much, we are bombarded by information today. So we receive on average about 10,000 ads a day today. With the development of technology, it's going to go, it's, I mean, it's gonna grow, right? So what's happening is that the more information we receive, the harder it is for us to understand what to focus on, what's important and what's not. We take up to 35,000 decisions a day, small decisions and big decisions. The more decisions we have to take, the more fatigue we're going to have. So, but because we receive so much information, as a consequence, we have to take all these decisions because we have to say no, yes, no, yes. So the less information we receive, the better it is because the more space we will have actually to take mindful decisions. So procrastination does exactly that. So for instance, I work a lot and I read and I watch usually, YouTube is my education channel. I watch educational videos. I read books about productivity, biography. So I quite serious books as well. So sometimes I need my brain to rest. <laughs> and how do I do that? By doing something that is not necessarily productive. So you can call it productive procrastination, you know, mindful procrastination, or you can call it productive rest where I'm mindful that I'm not sort of making my brain think in the moment, but I'm making it rest because it needs rest. Love it. Love it. I I, I didn't know that we take 35,000 smaller or bigger decisions per day. Yeah. And I'm trying to remove like the what clothes I'm going to wear in the morning, like small things. Yeah. But then I have like 34,990 more. So I guess, I, yes. I don't know. I don't know. It's a process, yeah. I guess. It's a process. <laughs> yeah. What What are some effective time management techniques that can help young web developers balance learning and productivity in the workplace? You know, at, at the beginning mm -hmm. of their careers, when they first joined the company, they they spent, I would say, half their time in actually writing code, half the time in learning either the company's code base or I don't know, other things related uh, to those skills. What what are some effective time management techniques for that? I think there is one that you've mentioned earlier, sort of by giving your own example of how you manage your calendar, and it's time boxing. So time boxing is basically taking your to-do list and everything that you want, and not only must, but also want to do in a day and put in it um, in your calendar. So you literally just put a blocker in your calendar. So as blocker, you can say, for example, this is you know the, the coding work, for example, this is email work, this is client work. Um, you can also say you can block time for lunch because it's very important because without, again, fuel and energy, we can't do the rest of the work. You can block time for learning. So this is one of, and I think Harvard Business Review called it the number one technique for time management. So it really, really, truly works. And what it allows you to do, it also allows you to sort of move it around when you need to and it allows you to foresee how your week will go because everything is there and you know you know exactly where time goes so the reason why today and i think it's i just want to mention this it's important uh, to understand why we value money much more than we value time today is because we can see money and at the end of the month we all get our bank statement but we don't have the time bank statement so when you start using your calendar in that way, where you put everything in there at the end of the month or at the end of the week, if you want to, or day, you can see your time bank statement. And it really shows you where did your time go? 
and was it worth it, right? So this is sort of one. And then the, the second one, I believe that in the world of today, we often prioritize quantity over quality. So mm -hmm. I understand the importance of continued learning, but I believe more in relevant learning and application. You can read 20 books and apply nothing, or you can read one book and constantly every single day apply something that you've learned from that book. Even when you read books, or even today we're talking, it's just information. If you don't try it, if you don't use it, you're not going to get the knowledge. The forgetting curve is really, really steep. So after an hour, you already don't remember 40% of what you've heard. So in order for you to remember, you have to apply it. So coming back to your question, how to balance is that balance is important, is that you've learned, you apply, you've learned, you apply. If you haven't applied yet, don't strive to learn something new. You're overwhelming yourself. You're going to for quantity instead of quality. And I know, you know, the, especially coding again, I'm not an expert there, but <laughs> I know Coding probably changes every single day. There are new tools and all of that. But again, it's 80-20 rule. You can't learn every single tool. You can't be an expert in every single tool. L pick what you really, really like and invest 80% of your learning time in there and become an expert in this. And the rest, 20, well, you can do whatever you want. I love this, Kate. I have to say, <laughs> I, I love your suggestions. They are really very specific and actionable. And what I would like to add uh, to, to expand on, on what you said is I, I, I started at some point, I was reading way too many books, was implementing little to nothing from those books. And then I set a goal. For every book, I implement one thing. There might be a hundred great ideas inside that book, but it's not the time for me to implement these hundred things. And I always picked one and bo one book after the another, one blog post after another. They add up, they add up. And at some point you really change your habits and skills and you can achieve fantastic results in yes. productivity, in time management, in being more fulfilled and happy from your work and life. It's it's really like a like a superpower. Absolutely. I would say. Yeah. And I think generally yeah. we we tend to start um, we, we tend to want to start big, right? Mm -hmm. And because and to say, well, I've read 10 books because we hear these headlines everywhere. Well, what's the purpose? Right. Like what, at the end, what's what's the goal? Is your goal yeah. to, you know, win a Guinness World Record for reading the most books? OK, then go on. That's fine. But if your goal is to learn, well, then it's probably different. Then you have to read and then you have to apply. Otherwise, you're not learning. Yeah. Many, many of our students, either during their studies or after graduation, they face what is called the imposter syndrome. My question is, as a web, as an entry level web developer, how can one strike a balance between continuous learning and avoiding burnout? Well, I think imposter syndrome is not just common at the entry level. It actually is there. And we just, <laughs> we just need to learn to deal with it. It's always going to be there. Imposter syndrome, and um, it was someone who explained this to me, it simply basically means that we're not confident at doing something. But if we want to grow, we have to try to do new things. And in the beginning, new things are scary. And that's why we feel the imposter syndrome. But when we start doing slowly, slowly, we get comfortable, right? And it's the, that phase of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable that is very, very scary and sort of makes us feel a little bit shaky. So in order, um, in order for, I think what helps me always to, because I get imposter syndrome as well, especially when I started posted on LinkedIn, for example, um, you know, having a career in CRM for 12 years and having no career in coaching, 
although I coached for the last four years, it's, it's very different. I'm still starting. So I'm, although maybe I'm a little bit older than the audience, but I I've started again, right. I've started something new. So I also feel the imposter syndrome, but I think what's important, uh, what helps me to get over it is to remember that nobody was born knowing we were all born without skills. We didn't know how to walk. And the way we learned to walk is that we tried, we fell, we tried again, we fell, we tried again, we fell, and suddenly we walked. And that's that's sort of how I think is everything in life, is that you, you try, you fall, you try, you fall, and then you suddenly start, it, it's working, you're doing it, right? So I think this is kind of an important thing. And um, coming back to sort of the question, how to avoid the burnout, I think a, a lot of, um, a lot of people and try to go fast and faster these days. Um, I'm listening to audiobooks and there is, you know, this function of listening twice the speed. And the question that I asked to myself, why? why? Why do I need to go faster? Like reading books for me is one of the best ways to slow down because the world is so fast. But yet I'm invited to, to go faster. And so I think that we forget that actually it's going slower that we achieve more. It's by doing less that we achieve more. I worked for an amazing company in Thailand um, who taught me that because I came from luxury retail, which was all about fast, 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 fast. Everything is important. And I came to Thailand, which is also a very different mindset in terms of as, as a culture. It's a culture that knows how to enjoy the time, how to take the time, how to slow down. And I learned that. So I learned that I could actually, if I had a very clear goal, I could achieve the goal without the need of speeding necessarily and racing. So... I think that this is sort of an important thing for us to, to understand. And one of the ways to deal with that is a lot of people, when you look at their to-do lists, there are like 50 points and they all must be done today. And this is just to understand, like it's a realistic approach to, to managing our own time and our own expectations. So one of the best techniques here is top three. Top three on your list, these are the must do today. Whatever you have time for afterwards, you can still do if you want to. But if not, you're happy, you achieved your goal of the day. And that sort of helps you to, to manage this uh, these kind of waves of when you need to give a little bit more. And then there are waves where you can actually give a little bit less. Many people think that productivity is a very straight line. But it's not. It's like that, like everything in life. So some days... I work and I feel very productive for eight hours, 10 hours, and some days nothing is coming up. But I think it's if you start noticing and you start asking yourself more and more questions, that's how you learn also about yourself and you understand what works for you and what doesn't. And you can also become more productive by understanding how you function as a human being. There is a concept called um, biological, uh, biological productive time so this is where you as a human being perform at your best, at your optimal sort of capacity uh, and energy. You have the optimal attention and focus. Um, if you start noticing this, for example, by using your calendar, um, mm -hmm. you will schedule the most important activities that require deep work during that time. For me, for example, it's morning. I know that in the evening, I'm not productive. I could never study in college past 9 p.m., but I would wake up at 5 a.m. and start studying again. So this works for me. I'm not advocating that everybody needs to fall in love with mornings. I'm advocating for you to start asking and noticing things about yourself. When are you performing and when are you not? Because if you don't have the energy in you during a particular time, you're not going to be productive. No matter how much, how much you force yourself, you just won't. So many things to say. I, have, I look at the time and uh, 
<laughs> I have to be mindful of that. I would like to invite uh, our audience, if, if they have any questions, please uh, write them wherever you join us from today and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to answer them towards uh, the end of the hour. Uh, trying to read between the lines, I, I see that you've done a lot of work with being mindful, mindfulness in general. Would you like to, to tell us your, your thoughts uh, on, first of all, what is mindfulness for you? Um, I think, I don't think that I have a clear definition of what is mindfulness for me, but I like to, maybe the term would be more self-awareness, it's sort of understanding mm -hmm ourselves. So I think that the most powerful productivity app and any kind of app that we have is our brain. So it's up here. So it's very important to understand how it works. And we don't, you know, use them. We will never use the maximum capacity of it, but at least we need to try to understand how it works in order to make our life more fulfilling for ourselves and for others. So I, um, one thing that I think can help people is to start asking questions to yourself. So I call them having conversations with ourselves. So we have on a daily basis, we have a lot of conversations face to face and even more so online, but rarely we have conversations with ourselves. There is a difference between telling to ourselves and having conversation with ourselves. Telling is I tell to myself, oh, you didn't do this. Conversation is that I ask myself a question. What is the reason I haven't managed to do this? And then I give myself an answer. So this is how I learn to talk to myself. There are a lot of sort of theories. There are books, um, for example, a book by Daniel Kahneman that is called Thinking Fast and Slow that talks about this system one and system two. There is another one that's called The Inner Game of Tennis that talks about the person one and the person two. So the whole idea is that we have two systems or two people that cohabit within us. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we feel sometimes overwhelmed or busy or, you know, if you use the word burnout, is because these two people are not aligned. Because one person is responsible for the actions, is the doer, and the other person is the thinker. And the thinker needs more time. So by having conversations with ourselves and asking ourselves questions, we actually learn to slow down our actions. And when we slow down our actions, we align these two people. And by having this alignment, we're feeling more comfortable and more sort of, we're taking actions that bring us energy, that bring us fulfillment, because these two people are in alignment. So this is sort of, for me, the concept of mindfulness. And that's why I love coaching, because coaching does exactly that, because it sort of asks you questions to pull out the information from you. But I do believe that we can, you know, do it at with any other sort of um, uh, disciplines that are out there, like even therapy is fantastic way. I also do therapy. I do Reiki. So I put it all together because this is the best way for us sort of to learn about ourselves and connect the dots uh, from from everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. So you mentioned at the beginning that one of the services you offer now with the the goodbusy.com, if I remember correctly, uh, you you support uh, people with interview pre preparation and, and whatnot. It, that's right, correct? In I don't do interview preparation, so I okay. do con productivity consulting, so whatever it can be, but. If we work on individual basis and you say, I want to make sure that this process is productive for myself, sure, we can sort of do that. Yeah. OK, 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 I see. So what, what are some strategies uh, to build a strong personal brand as a as a web developer in our case? But I think this apply this is quite universal. Uh, and mm -hmm. how can this positively impact career growth and opportunities? I think the number one sort of piece of advice that I would give is to ask more questions. I think people do not ask enough questions today. They either assume and guess, and every time we assume a guess, we have a 50% chance to guess wrong. 
So whenever uh, sort of you are building a personal brand, you need to remember that people buy from people and people work with people. So in order for you to work well with people, you have to get to know them. So these are the questions, right? So we can't, as a developer, you're probably offering a solution. And I'm bringing that a little bit from my experience when I worked with yeah. developers and, uh, and uh, people in, in IT as well. Um, so what happens is that a lot of um, there's a lot of valuable work that developers and I and my XIT colleagues were doing, but sometimes there was a disconnect between what they were doing and what actually was valuable for me. Why? Because there were not enough questions. There was not enough com communication. And the problem with that is that it created a lot of bad business for them because they created something that we we couldn't use. We 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 didn't need that. So it's important to learn to ask questions to identify, first of all, if you're talking to a potential client, you need to identify who they are, what their needs, what their problem is, what they've tried in the past. This, all this information will allow you to find the right solution for them. And you can actually bring them value. You can actually create something they need. The same if you're looking for a job. If um, what happened to me when I was interviewing, a lot of people didn't have questions. And how would you know if, I'm looking for exactly that. If you don't ask me questions, ask questions. What are they looking yeah. for? What what does the candidate need to have? What does the out what is the outcome that the candidate needs to achieve, right? What what else? What what do you need to do to stand out? So ask all those questions. People are willingly giving you answers, but we don't ask questions enough. Another one is use your network. So use your network no matter who they are, even if you don't know them reach out to them and ask a question. It doesn't cost a thing. And you would be surprised how many people answer. So um, there is a statistic sort of that says that 90% of people who receive a request to help say yes. So, but there are very, very few people who ask. So asking question, questions is such an underrated skill because we sort of, again, we just jump to conclusions. We think we know, we are afraid to say we don't know. And so what happens is that we miss a lot of opportunities. So whenever you are asked questions, whether it's with your client, with a potential employer, or with somebody who can be a trampling to a potential employment in the future, just ask questions. You simply don't know. Yeah. Is, is this statistic coming from people you know or people you don't know and you ask away? Do you it, remember? It's just I. It, it's a. It was a general statistic. It didn't say okay. uh, sort of. But generally speaking, like if I take my own example, when I I'm very active on LinkedIn, I still managed to reply to majority of people. But even before, when people were reaching out to me, for example, because I was a hiring manager, I would still reply. And I do believe that a lot of people replied when I in my career also reached out to people. A lot of people replied. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, what I would add to this, because I've reached out to ev pretty much every Greek big and tech entrepreneur, uh, be very specific with your ask. Don't go and ask 10 questions. Go slow, ask mm -hmm. one small question, make the decision super easy for the person to answer to you yeah. or not answer to you. It has to be specific, unique, and just one thing. Exactly. Not 10 things. Exactly. And once once they answer the first question, then maybe they answer the follow-up question that you might have. So right. be strategic, play the long game, and you can't imagine the people you'll have in, in your network after a few months or years. It's it's exactly. it's unbelievable. So the, the same message, go slow. One question yeah. at a time. Uh, I, I feel I, I listen to sometimes in books in speed of 2.5x. Uh, I, 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 I trained myself like I, I took the slow process and I trained myself to be able. But and recently I'm listening to one or 1.25, especially in video podcast. And I feel so bad about myself. I think after today's conversation, though, I have to relax if if this is what my brain needs then this is what i will uh, provide so we you see we achieved our goal today <laughs> <laughs> one person true, true. <laughs>
true, true, true. <laughs> so, uh, Panagiotis Papadopoulos from our, our audience asks, I know that procrastination is a huge chapter, uh, being a mode of defense, etc. And there are a lot of resources available on how to tackle it. But I would really appreciate Kate's valuable experience and perception about practical ways to tackle it. So there are actually, um, there is a great resource that I have. So if you can reach out to me on, on LinkedIn, I'll share with you the resource. But basically, there are six triggers of procrastination and they are all emotional. So it's either the task is unstructured, it's either it's boring, it's either we simply don't know how to do it. And there are three more. I'm I, like on top of my head, they're not there. But Basically, when you know exactly what is it, what's driving your, what's the trigger of your own procrastination for a specific task, you can find the antidote. So, for example, for me, when the task is boring, you can delegate, right? So this is one, one of the ways to do that. Another one, when you don't know specifically the task, what you, you, you can do is um, you can ask somebody to teach you. So that's another another way to sort of you know, fight the procrastination. So you can find the, the antidote, but reach out to me and I'm happy to send you the, the full information. Lovely, lovely. If, if any of our uh, members of our audience has any questions, now is the time. Uh, Kate, do you have anything that I haven't asked about that you would like to mention? Like anything I've missed, anything you think would make sense uh, to mention uh, towards our audience? I think we talked about so many things, but uh, I think, again, I, then if there is one thing that you need to remember from our conversation today, for me, it would be start with the end in mind. If, mm. and no matter what task, and no matter how small or big it is, always start with the end in mind. If you have the end in mind, you are basically signaling to your brain where to go, where to focus, and you will find the solution much faster. When you don't have the destination, you're just going to go around in circles and it's going to be a hamster wheel. And this is the hamster wheel usually you know, leads to, to burnout or um, yeah, fatigue. So start every single time, start with the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I feel that sometimes people feel a bit hopeless with burnout. They think that it, like burnout exists, so I, for some reason, must also face that. And it's not the case. You can really work and plan and use all the techniques you mentioned and then some uh, in order for you to not get there. It's not, it's not a badge of honor <laughs> being burned out and being sick for, for uh, weeks or, or months or, or whatever. It's really not a badge of honor. Um, I agree. And I think it's, it's, um, there is a cognitive bias that is in place here. It's called group thinking. Um, so negativity attracts. Uh, so um, that's why there is so many negative news, right? So, so much negativity in the news. So what happens is that we automatically think that everything is bad because we only hear about bad things. So we kind of say, okay, if they say working is bad, if this is bad, so we automatically think that this is how it is. So this is called group thinking. But I think it's important to understand that not everybody goes through the burnout. And also we need to be very careful in the way we use the words because burnout is a diagnosis and you can't self-diagnose. If you are really feeling that you might need help, you have to go and get help. But just saying to yourself, you are burned out. No, you're probably having, you know, you're lost. You're, there's a lot of chaos. You're, there's a lot of fatigue. And what you need to do is just to get proper rest and reset, pause, rethink of what you're doing and move on. But if you're thinking really that you're on the verge, then you need to get proper help. Okay, uh, I have I have a, a last question, uh, also uh, in regards to to our, to our mostly our graduates, uh, which is learning new programming languages and frameworks can be very challenging sometimes. What are some proven sorry What are some proven methods to accelerate the learning process and grasp these concepts more effectively? 
So I think it's important to understand how the science of learning works. Um, so 25% starts with a learning goal. If you do not have a learning goal, you're not going to learn what you want. So fix a learning goal, make sure that it's relevant for you and it's meaningful and it's personal. That's 25%. The other 25% come from the, the, the moment when you learn. So you have to be present. I'm not going to say anything new here. Take notes. It's proven already that taking, I know that for probably developers, it's very hard to accept to take notes by hand. <laughs> but if you can, sometimes just try it because it's proven that we remember much more when we take our notes by hand. And then the most important part, it's called, it's responsible for 50% of how we learn and what we remember. It's called retrieval. So this is what we discussed earlier. So it's the application of what you've learned. So there are different ways of how you can sort of retrieve. One of the ways you can test yourself. So you can create your own mini quizzes, flashcards, anything you want. The second one, the one that I love the most is tell a friend. Tell a friend what you've learned, tell a colleague what you've learned, tell anyone what you've learned. Another one is recommend what you've learned to someone else and explain to them why they will benefit of it. Um, another way is to add bigger context to what you've learned. So this is what I've learned. Great. How am I going to use it? How am I going to use it tomorrow? How am I going to use it in a week from now? How am I going to use it in a year? So it helps you to sort of have a bigger picture of how this particular knowledge can influence your life or your work, etc. So it's step-by-step -step process, but it starts once again from the end in mind. Yeah, and patience. I, I It comes to my mind uh, all the time, patience, patience, patience be patience, patient, be strategic yes. about it. Yes. and you will get there yes. uh, before we wrap up i would like to mention three things that i i really liked from everything you said although it was so many things but these three stand out for me which is mindful procrastination it's it's, it's a great concept i learned today uh, the time bank statement which is absolutely awesome uh, and now Google Calendar has this option that measures the hours that you put in. It, it, like, it can do the work for you, so it becomes so much easier. And then feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable. This, these three quotes, I would say, uh, defined my experience today here talking with you, Kate. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they are. They might be not my quotes. <laughs> I probably yeah, heard yeah, them. Yeah, I, I heard course. them somewhere for sure, but I'm glad these are great messages to to walk away with for sure. Awesome. I don't see any other questions at this time from our audience. So, Kate, the stage is yours. Uh, please share with us where can we find you or anything else that you would like to mention. Well, thank, again, thank you so much for giving the opportunity. And I'm very active on LinkedIn, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Connect with me, but when you send me a connection request, just you know mention that we, you've attended the event so I know who you are and I will accept your connection. And if you have any additional questions, DM me um, in, on LinkedIn is the best way to sort of get in touch with me. I'm there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kate, for for joining us today. You've been very enthusiastic up until uh, today's call. It, it was really interesting to get to know you a bit more. I would absolutely love to do a second round at some point because I have so many things that I wanted to ask during sure. uh, <laughs> during our chat today. Uh, but I would like to acknowledge you. I I, I love the journey you've had. Uh, to me, it's it's a journey of growth and curiosity, and I'm looking forward in following you and uh, see see how how your next steps and, and where Thank it takes you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You very I much. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks Thank everyone. you everyone for joining. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye.